All right. So we finished off uh, last week talking a little bit about the, uh, the holy place. We're talking about the understanding of the lamp, the way that it was laid out, the table with the shoe bread, the way it was laid out, and the big ball. So we continue in Hebrews 9. We're just going to read a short section of them. We'll continue a little bit with our description as we're moving on to the Holy of Holies, but uh, let's just see where, where the Lord takes us in that. Um, so Hebrews 9, verses uh, 1 through 10. The first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place for worship here on earth. There were two rooms in the tabernacle. In the first room, there was a lampstand, a table, sacred loaves on, on this table, the room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was a second room called the most holy place. In that room, there was a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered in gold on all sides. Inside the Ark was a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that had sprouted leaves, and stone tablets of the covenant. Above the Ark, there were cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the Ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail right now. But when these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room and they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people that had been committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustrating point to the present time, for the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offered were not able to cleanse the consciences of the people that bring them. For that old system deals only with food, drink, and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations were in effect only until a better system could be established. So I promised you that I would have a sketch-up model uh, of of the tabernacle so that you would have a better understanding. And I do have something that I prepared for you that I took and I modified because why rebuild it if it's already there? Um, but there's a couple of things that we need to point out first and foremost. The first thing is we're talking about the tabernacle here. There's a reason that the author of Hebrews talks about the tabernacle because it is a sign of the first covenant that has been made immediately after he has freed them, brought them out of slavery. So it's not talking about the temple, though the temple was copied after the tabernacle. The tabernacle, as we discussed before, is a shadow, a copy of those things in heaven. It was told to Moses specifically that he was to build this exactly as he had seen. So this exists in heaven. This is an example for us all. There's one thing you need to understand about the tabernacle. It's clear that this is what the author is talking about and not the temple because of one thing and one thing alone. If you throw everything to the side, you've got this. Every time that they were to camp, the first thing that would go up would be the temple. The temple would always be aligned properly so that the north wall had the table with the shoe bread south wall had the lamp. Around the courtyard would be the tents of all the tribes of Israel. So the tabernacle stood at the very heart of their camp. Once the tabernacle was set up, the presence of God would descend upon it as a cloud during the day, and it would be fire within the cloud of so no matter where they were, no matter where they were camped, 
God was in the heart of them always. We have a description of the Holy of Holies. We have a description of the Holy Place. So let's take a quick walk, and I forgot the remote for the projector. So I will take a walk. There'll be improvements to this, but bear with me. So here is the setup of the tabernacle. The tents of the different tribes would be set up specifically grouped by tribe on each section. Each tribe had their specific spot. I will be adding the tribes, their names, and where their tents would sit so that you can see that as well. The outer area was open to everybody. There were no issues with anybody going. There's the altar for the sacrifice, but this is the holy place. In the holy place, you have the lamp that we talked about, filled with olive oil, the only light in this room. As you saw from the outside picture, this is completely covered. There are no windows into this area at all. But the... Can we stop pause? But... The walls are inlaid with gold, highly polished gold. And that one lampstand is enough to fill that entire room with light. Across from that is the table, the table that has the loaves of bread, a piece of bread for each tribe. The light from the lampstand shines continuously down upon it. There is also a setup for a pitcher with wine. This is our first example of a communion table. Here is the altar for the incense. Now you notice the author of Hebrews says that this is in the Holy of Holies, but it is not. It seems weird. Some would say, well, he made a mistake here. He's not talking about its actual physical presence, but it is innately tied to the Holy of Holies. The purpose of the altar of incense is to produce a sweet smell unto God. So the smell from the incense in the, in the altar wafts through the veil, through the curtain, into the most holy of place of the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God to receive mercy. So his saying that it is in that room is a direct connection to its function, not to its physical location. After the incense burner, into the most holy place, which contained the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant has atop of it the only other piece of pure gold in the tabernacle. That would be the top. The top of it is pure gold. It has a cherubim on each side with wings outstretched over it, covering the mercy seat, which is right where the five might be. This is where the presence of God rested. There was only one person that was allowed to go into this area when God's presence was there. God's presence descended upon it once the tabernacle was completed every time that it was put up. Once a year, the high priest was able to enter in here, but he could not do so without doing a couple of things. He had to shed the blood of a bull. He had to take that blood, dip it on the altar of incense on each of the points on the corners, then he had to sprinkle it upon himself, upon the veil, and on the seat. Then he had to leave. Then he was able to perform the reason he was there. He was able to perform the guilt offering for those that were unaware of their guilt. 
He would take the goat and he would slaughter it and he would shed that blood on the mercy seat. Then he would go out and take a second goat, pray the sins onto that goat and it would be let free into the wilderness, dead sin and dead scapegoat. The priest could not present himself in this place anytime he wanted. He was the only person that could go here and he could only go there if he shed the blood of a male bull, because there are no female bulls. Although in commercial law, you hear male voices speaking as if they were cows, they were not male. They were bulls. Cows are bulls. He could only do this once a year if he messed up at all. If he forgot to put the blood on the incense altar. If he forgot to sprinkle the blood on the beer, if he forgot to anoint himself, if he went into the Holy of Holies, he would die. He could not approach the seat of God. He could not approach the seat of mercy unless he followed each and every step that had been laid out. If you want to read those steps that had to be laid out, I would highly recommend specifically Leviticus 4 and Leviticus 7. It is important enough that it was laid out at least twice, and that's not all of it, but those are the most clear sections that speak specifically of the guilt offering which is taking place. It's important that you understand that the high priest only approached this area once a year. It was specifically for the guilt offering. And it is something that needed to be dealt with over and over and over again. It's been something that's weighed heavily on my heart. As we deal with a world that doesn't want to deal with their guilt at all. But the very first thing that you hear when anybody is arrested or accused of anything is an immediate not guilty. When you have people that are acquitted of homicide by vehicle because of, see if I can say it right, affluenza. That was an actual argument. My son is so affluent. He has no idea of the consequences of his actions. Yes. The world we live in, the society that we live in, that doesn't want to deal with the reality of guilt. What God has laid down here deals with it. And it had to be done in a specific way. It had to be done with the understanding that there is blood to be shed to cover that. So I'm going to end here. I'm going to hear more next week because it's still heavy on my heart. I want you to discuss that. I want you to see the corollary to today's society to understand where we're headed as a society and to understand the mechanics that was put in place for a nation that didn't know how to govern themselves, that didn't know how to take care of these things, that had to be reminded each and every step that had to be taken. We need to understand that you understand what we go through today that man back there will be talking after me in two weeks about the covenant that we live under and how that affects us. But you need to understand the covenant they lived under and how it affected their lives because they're going through it now. They have to understand it and take hold of it and deal with it. They can't just be left alone. So please discuss. Be back in 20 minutes.